A family is torn apart by an earthquake. I thought we were being bombed. I thought the world was coming to an end. Their fight to reunite on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Some famous Americans and a leading psychiatrist are now saying that marriage is a dying institution. The breakup of celebrity couples like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Maria Shriver has increased the focus on the future of marriage in America. Ephraim Graham has the story. We both love each other very much. We are very fortunate that we have four extraordinary children and uh, we're taking one day at a time. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Maria Kennedy Shriver's separation after 25 years of marriage surprises many who see them as the perfect political power couple. I think we all thought that it was, you know, it was a good match, but sometimes it doesn't work. The story made even more headlines today when Schwarzenegger revealed he fathered a child with a member of his household staff more than a decade ago, something he told his wife before they separated last week. The Schwarzenegger Shriver split adds fuel to a fiery headline in the June edition of Maxim Magazine. Actress Cameron Diaz declares marriage is a dying institution, saying I don't think we should live our lives in relationships based off old traditions that don't suit our world any longer. I kind of received that that public headline with a degree of humor, like that's someone's personal uh, perspective, but it's not consistent with with where we are as a society or where societies are around the world. Psychologist Jane Sells is a marriage counselor, Regent University professor and co-author of the new book, Counseling Couples in Conflict. Today he is training church leaders to be better marriage counselors. Is marriage changing? Most certainly. And the, the expectations of marriage and how people enter into marriage and what time in their lives they enter into marriage. But while marriage may be changing, Dr. Sells disagrees with noted psychiatrist Dr. Keith Ablo, who joins Diaz's claim the institution is dying. Ablo writes, I'm not certain marriage ever did suit most people who tried it. By every measure, marriage is, is a severe benefit for all involved. Uh, society benefits, husbands benefit, wives benefits, children's benefit. Science is on Sells' side. Studies show married people live longer, healthier, and often wealthier lives than single people. Across really every sector of society, marriage is a beneficial institution. So that it is dying, no. That, that individuals have found marriage to be difficult and hard and sometimes chosen different life paths, obviously. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. Well, the current debate is actually quite old, and when you look back through the history of mankind, uh, you certainly see within the elite of cultures, uh, whether that's European aristocracy or the Roman leading families, or today in our celebrity culture, uh, a rather loose definition of marriage. But for the culture at, at large, marriage provides an unbelievable benefit uh, not just for the couple involved, but for their children and for their grandchildren. And when you look what happens generationally based on couples who divorce, uh, you start seeing the cost of divorce and you start seeing the cost of not honoring the institution. It's the stability and long-term stability of families that leads to wealth and leads to an increase for the society that protects marriage. Uh, those are basic historical facts. When you see a breakdown of marriage, you see uh, societies go into disarray. When you see strong, healthy marriages, those societies grow. Lee Webb has the rest of our top stories from the CBN Newsroom. Lee? Gordon, the U.S. Supreme Court says it will not hear an atheist's case challenging the inclusion of So Help Me God in the president's inaugural oath. That phrase is not in the oath required by the Constitution, but many presidents have added it. Atheist Michael Newdow says, So Help Me God is unconstitutional and infringes on his atheistic beliefs. 
Newdow has also sued unsuccessfully to strike the words under God from the Pledge of Allegiance and at God we trust from U.S. currency. One would hope Washington's leaders would turn to God to address America's mounting debt. The government has reached its maximum debt limit, $14.3 trillion. But the Treasury Department has bought a little more time. It has given Congress until August 2nd to take action before the government defaults. Charlene Israel has that story. Republicans and Democrats are working to reach an agreement that would allow the government to borrow more money and pay for its operation. Increasing the statutory limit. Congress has raised its own credit limit more than 100 times since 1940. But at $14.3 trillion, there are critical sticking points this time around. Republicans say they won't approve raising the debt limit until the president agrees to substantial spending cuts. In a recent appearance on the 700 Club, Senator Rand Paul said we're on the brink of a disaster. I see on the horizon a debt crisis where it becomes increasingly difficult to pay our bills as a country. Foreign countries such as Japan, which have their own natural disaster, China, India, that have been buying our debt for so long, begin to buy less of it, interest rates rise, and then we pay our debt by simply printing money. Vice President Joe Biden is leading bipartisan negotiations in hopes that Congress will act before August 2nd. At that point, the federal government will default on its debts. But political observers are still urging lawmakers not to give the president a blank check. I would say find a formula and pass very, very short debt ceiling increases with very small amounts and take some savings that the president couldn't possibly veto. And if you had to do a debt ceiling every three weeks, but do not give him a blank check. Some conservatives are talking about selling off government assets like land and buildings, or even the 261 million ounces of gold the Treasury Department owns. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner has ordered the government to stop investing in two retirement funds for federal employees so it can continue to borrow. Because Congress has not yet acted to raise the limit, we have now set in motion a series of extraordinary measures that will give Congress some additional time to raise the debt limit. Those measures include borrowing billions from special government funds while lawmakers continue to hash out a resolution. Charlene Israel, CBN News. The debt, of course, is expected to be a major political issue in next year's presidential election. And with Donald Trump and Mike Huckabee now out of the race for the Republican nomination, the GOP still lacks a clear front runner. Flooding along the Mississippi River has stabilized in Louisiana. Over the weekend, the Army Corps of Engineers opened a major spillway to ease the pressure on levees in and around Baton Rouge. Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal says it's working. Many rural areas are being flooded, but projected crests along the river have been lowered. And officials in Baton Rouge say their stress levels are dropping too. That just brings uh, that much more added relief for us. At, in our neighborhood and anywhere in the area. We have a comfort level, but we can't be complacent because still, you know, the unknown factor is if there is ever a breach in this levee, then there are a whole new set of circumstances that we'll have to deal with. Now, the region is not out of danger just yet. There is concern that uh, water could get underneath those levees. Hard to believe that not far west of all of that flooding, there's a drought. Some parts of Texas have not seen significant rain since August. Farms and cattle ponds are drying up, and it's fueled wildfires that are engulfing thousands of square miles across the Lone Star State. In southern Arizona, one fire chief says conditions there are the driest they've been in a quarter century. A federal grand jury has indicted a missionary for helping a Christian mother take her daughter overseas during a custody battle. This is a story CBN News has followed for years. Lisa Miller joined in a civil union with her lesbian partner, Janet Jenkins, 11 years ago. Miller gave birth to a daughter, accepted Jesus Christ, renounced the lesbian lifestyle, and separated from Jenkins. A judge awarded Miller custody of her daughter, but after she refused to grant visitation rights to Jenkins, Jenkins received custody. That's when Miller and her daughter fled to Nicaragua, allegedly with that missionary's help. A U.S. congressman is pushing to make international religious freedom a greater priority at the State Department. Jennifer Wishon has that story now from Washington. For some reason, people aren't as interested in human rights and religious freedom as they used to be. 
When Virginia Congressman Frank Wolf created the Office of International Religious Freedom in 1988, he says it was a dominant issue. Then President Ronald Reagan was an international force to be reckoned with, who considered the words of the U.S. Constitution to be a covenant with the rest of the world. But Wolf says concern for religious freedom has diminished. In Iraq, where more biblical activities took place in any other country other than Israel, the Iraqi Christians are going through a very difficult time. They speak the same language as Jesus. Daniel is buried there. Babylon. Abraham is from Iraq. Esther is, is from Iraq. People just don't really focus, and now you're finding Iraqi Christians gunned down. His legislation would, in part, require religious freedom training for all Foreign Service officers, strengthen the countries of particular concern designation process for nations that deny religious freedom, and elevate the International Religious Freedom Ambassador so he or she reports directly to the Secretary of State. <laughs> New York City pastor Dr. Susan Johnson Cook has just been tapped by President Obama for the position and she's walking onto a volatile world stage. I mean, in Pakistan, they, they gunned down the only Christian member of the cabinet, uh, Shabazz Bhatti. They gunned him down. You have a Christian woman uh, in Pakistan in jail for blasphemy and yet we're just shoveling the money in into Pakistan. Dr. Susan Johnson Cook will identify countries that persecute people of faith, which will then be subject to U.S. sanctions. Congressman Wolf says religious freedom is an American issue. When a country has human rights and religious freedom, they're generally a democratic country. They're generally a country that you're not at war with. Uh, you're not arguing with, you're not fighting with. Looking ahead to 2012, Congressman Wolf intends to write a letter to every Republican candidate running for president, urging them to make human rights and religious freedom a top priority. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Gordon, let me ask you a question. How far should we as Christians go with that? I mean, Jesus told us to expect the, the kind of persecution that many are, are, are saying. It's not that we condone that sort of thing, but how far do we go with legislative action on this sort of thing? Well, we're citizens, and as citizens, we have the right to vote. And let's realize that those, those rights can be extinguished. Uh, I, I've met with Christians who uh, were... were Christians in North Korea, and then what happened to their families? They were able to get out uh, after the war. They were able to, to, to leave, and what happened to their families and what happened to every Christian in North Korea was absolutely horrible. And when, when you consider what a repressive government can do today, if the full mechanisms of the state are, are put to, to stamp out particular belief systems, uh, the persecution can get uh, to the level of extinction. So we've got to stand up for religious freedom. Now, as an American, do you believe in the ideals of America? Do you still believe in the Declaration of Independence? Do you still believe in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? Do you think that's the best way uh, and, and if you do, then I applaud you. If you don't, then you, you've got to come to grips that have, have we somehow lost our way because we've lost our ideals. Are we perfect? No. But we've been, and Ronald Reagan declared, we're a city on a hill. We're, we're the mankind's hope of freedom. Uh, this is why people want to come here. Now, in, in our foreign policy, why should we have... Uh, an emphasis on religious freedom? Well, Congressman Wolf said it best. If you find religious freedom in a culture, then you also find freedom of expression, you find free press, you find democracy. And they're less likely to be your foe in the future. So we should encourage that. Unfortunately, our State Department for the past um, 10, 11 years hasn't pursued that. When you look at the governments that we set up, in Afghanistan and we set up in Iraq, uh, they enshrined Sharia law in the constitution of those governments. That's not religious freedom. And that's why today we're seeing the persecution of some of the oldest Christian communities in the world in Iraq. 
where they're leaving in droves. And when you look at what's happening in Egypt now, where the Muslim Brotherhood has formed a political party and has, uh, in spite of all their pledges back in February, they're now running a candidate for president. What does that mean for one of the oldest Christian communities, the Coptic Church in Egypt? Well, it's not going to be good news. It's time for America to stand up. What do we believe, and do we still believe, that the, we're the best choice for the future of the human race? If we do, then we need to stand for religious freedom. Terry? Well, up next, China's one-child policy may have helped one of the country's biggest problems, but it's created another one. Find out what it is next. And then later, we'll answer questions from our live chat room, so log on to CBN.com and submit your questions now. Do you take fish oil? There's an omega-3 supplement that's better than regular fish oil. Staying healthy, it's not easy. I exercise regularly and eat lots of fruits and vegetables. I used to take a fish oil supplement too, but then I discovered something better than regular fish oil. Arctic Wonder Omega-3 Krill Oil. It's from the makers of One A Day, so I know I can trust it. The Omega-3s in Arctic Wonder both support heart health and are scientifically proven to be better absorbed than regular fish oil. You'd have to take six of these fish oil soft gels to get the strength of just two Arctic Wonder soft gels. The Arctic Wonder does not have an aftertaste. They go down real easy. Arctic Wonder isn't just good for your heart. It also supports healthy brain function and a healthy immune system. This is one of the products that I plan to take for the rest of my life. Arctic Wonder is from one a day and not available in stores. For a special trial offer, call or go online now. Call 1-800-409-7339. That's 1-800-409-7339. Or go online to tryarcticwonder.com now. Tomorrow. I was out here with some kids, and we came across a dead body not too far away here. They're the hidden homeless. You probably have a difficult time picking them out. Thousands of teens living on and off the streets. You can kind of see one of the holes that some of the teens have slept in. How one man is giving these kids a chance. My name is Dr. Randy Christensen, and I have the best job in the world. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. Well, for decades, Chinese families preferred baby boys to baby girls. Now that's slowly changing. China's booming economy is growing numbers of parents hoping for daughters. George Thomas has more on this from Beijing. The funny things parents do to make their little ones smile. And what a smile Ju Miang has. She is the joy of my life. When Li Hai Ying and her husband discovered they were having a girl two years ago, they were ecstatic. The Chinese culture traditionally favor boys. So when you have a girl, couples will sometimes have an abortion, but not us. Ju and Li Hai, both Christians, are not alone. More and more Chinese families are beginning to reconsider the centuries-old preference for boys. Boys are desired because they will support and look after the parents in their old age. Also, boys have a better chance of finding work and supporting themselves. But people's attitudes about this are changing especially when it comes to the role of women in society and their ability to thrive in a predominantly male culture. I own my own business here in the city and I'm able to provide for my family. So unlike in the past, today more women are getting an education and they are entering the workforce and doing well. For Ju Wen Hao and growing number of families, having a girl is seen as a huge savings on the family budget. If you have a boy, the parents are responsible for buying him an apartment before he gets married. Add to that the cost of educating him and all the other expenses, it adds up. When a baby is born in China, it's uh, quite uh, customary to get uh, a traditional outfit. Here's one for, for the girl and here's one for, uh, for the boy. You know, uh, the concept of having girls today, uh, especially in the big cities, uh, is, is prevalent in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, uh, and so forth. But in the countryside, the overwhelming majority of people still want a boy. And because the traditional preference for a male offspring is still so strong, Chinese women continue to practice sex-specific abortions, especially in rural areas. The result is a severe gender imbalance. Decades under the controversial one-child-per-couple policy 
has left China with more men than women. The government's attempt to keep the birth rates down has been a huge success, but the consequences of this social experiment are devastating. A Chinese government-backed study says in the next 20 years, there will be more than 24 million men of marrying age unable to find spouses. In fact, in some parts of the country, the male-female ratio is so acute that women and girls are kidnapped from neighboring countries, brought into China and forced into marriages. The one-child policy has contributed to this problem, and that needs to change. But it is only half the problem. We have to change people's view about just having boys. The Chinese government is trying to gradually fix the problem. Earlier this year, authorities reduced the fines for wealthier couples living in Beijing and Shanghai wanting two or more children. There's also discussion about changing the one-child policy within the next five years. Welcome news to Zhu Meiyang's parents, who are part of a new generation of Chinese couples whose expectations of a family have changed. I cannot afford to have another baby just yet, but definitely down the road in a couple of years, it will be nice to have that option. But for now, we are very thankful to God for our baby girl. George Thomas, CBN News in Beijing. Now China sometimes gives us this in these incredible lessons of unintended consequences of social engineering. Uh, when a central government starts to mandate things, supposedly for the good of all society, then what happens? Within the Chinese culture, if you don't have a boy, you, you lose your family name. And, and the family line is extinguished. So th there's a lot at stake here, not just uh, the cost and, and um, you know, will the boy take care of you when you're old? Uh, there's a much bigger issue of are you dishonoring your ancestors by allowing your line to die? Now we're into a, a situation where because of sex selection abortions, um, there are huge numbers of single males uh, coming of age in China. And what does that mean? And, and where do you go with that as a society? Uh, some of the neighboring com countries are worried, and they're worried for two reasons. Uh, one, does that uh, now give the uh, military in China a huge advantage because uh, they'll, they'll have all these young men with uh, no families, and they'll go to war. The other is, uh, well, how are they going to find wives? They're going to they're start crossing the border and taking our women back home with them. So there's, there's two issues here. Uh, and how do you deal with it? Um, uh, I hope they relax the one-child policy. And I hope they start understanding this social experiment has not worked out for them. And let's stop it before future generations have a spin-off effect. And what do you do when you don't have married couples within your culture? Short-term answer without a long-term vision, right? right. <laughs> well, up next, when a 7.0 magnitude quake struck Haiti, this mom was, uh, was able to escape herself but had to leave her three-year-old son behind. Hear her story when we return. Here we go. Get ready, because now the more fun you have, the more fit you can get. Introducing the Curved Circuit with Zumba Fitness. It's the only class that mixes the music and moves of Zumba with the proven strength training of Curves for one wildly effective 30-minute workout. Dance on in for a free week. Burn up to 500 calories in 30 minutes and shimmy as you sculpt. Call now to reserve your place in a class that will fill up fast. The Curved Circuit with Zumba Fitness. It's the wildly effective workout that's only at Curves. What makes the miracles of Jesus even more miraculous? Standing where they happened, in Israel. Come sail the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus calmed a raging storm. Experience Jerusalem, where Jesus restored a paralyzed man. Explore Capernaum, where Jesus spoke a centurion servant into health. To learn more about standing where it all happened in Israel, visit GoIsrael.com. Come visit Israel. You'll never be the same. 
To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. In January 2010, Kristen Howerton had two items on her agenda, run a half marathon and then head to Haiti to visit her soon to be adopted son. Shortly before the race, Kristen blogged that running that event was going to be among the best and the worst things that she'd ever done in her life. But little did she know she'd soon say the same thing about her Haiti trip. We always knew that adoption would be a way that God would use to build our family. We were always committed to that and, and excited about building our family uniquely through adoption, as well as having pregnancies and, and biological children. So the order of our family is that Jafta is five, he was adopted first, and then um, a little bit later we found out we were pregnant with India, and on the same day that India was born, Kembe was born in Haiti. And we found out about Kembe about six months later when he was six months old. Um, during a visit when we went down to Haiti with Jafta and India, we met Kembe and knew we wanted him to be in our family. But. And during the process, uh, the two and a half year process of adopting Kembe, mm. Karis came along. And our heart has always been that, um, that, 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 that adoption is really God's heart for kids and that every child deserves a loving home and every child needs a loving home. In early 2010, I decided I would take a trip but I took our baby daughter with us, so she and I flew down to Haiti for what was just really supposed to be a four or five day quick trip to visit, kind of check on the status of the adoption. Um, and the second night I was there, um, the earthquake happened. At 4.53 in the afternoon of January the 12th, a major earthquake hit the small island nation of Haiti. The impact of the 7.0 magnitude quake the worst in the region in 200 years, was devastating. When it happened, it was so confusing. It was so, so powerful that I, I thought we were being bombed. I thought the world was coming to an end. I, I really couldn't figure out what was going on because the, um, the shaking was, it was as if I was standing on a blanket and someone was trying to shake me off the blanket. We could hear screaming coming from the streets. We could see that houses had toppled along that street. This can't be true, you know, because we're hearing stories of just people beginning to line bodies up on the street and so many people injured. And it was so horrific, it was just hard to believe that it could be real. We had no idea what was going on. I think the rest of the world knew more than we did because CNN was playing for everyone else. We had nothing. Um, and I remember the next morning, once an internet connection was established, um, the missionary family pulled up a picture of the palace that had been collapsed. And all of us, I think, just sighed this heavy sigh of, wow, this, this is really bad. Hundreds of thousands either lost their lives or were injured. Millions remained displaced as they looked for family members in the middle of chaos. But government was crippled. And the palace has collapsed. It's like. It's like the White House collapsing. I remember getting the call that, that the earthquake had happened and then listened to a voicemail of Kristen's that, that said um, that she was okay, but, but very scared. And the focus at, at that point just became, how do we get Kristen home? We, we know that she's safe. We know that there's these aftershocks still happening. You know, being inside of the building was unsafe. And we would be, there were so many aftershocks that I would just be grabbing Karis and grabbing Kembe and running out the door and constantly aware um, any time that you were indoors of where the door was and how quickly you could get out. I mean, it was, it was a surreal experience where you're just literally feeling unsafe and these aftershocks in the first 24 hours were coming every hour. Myself and a number of friends on Facebook, a number of friends around the country, people from our church, for our were just praying for us. We're online all night trying to find ways to get emergency evacuation um, for you and Karis. And, and we didn't know what was going to happen with Kimbe. Get you guys to safety. And it was this constant just fight of feeling like our hands were tied and, and have nothing but faith and nothing but a sense of I hope they're okay, I, I pray they're okay, because there's nothing that I can do sitting here in California while my family's halfway around the world. 
A couple days in, we made our way to the embassy. We had heard that the embassy was evacuating people out on military jets. We spent the night at the embassy, and then in the middle of the night, we had embassy personnel coming in telling us, okay, there's a plane here, and we were just corralled um, into SUVs, taken to the airport, and put on a huge military jet. We made our way to Pennsylvania, and then to Chicago, and then finally back home. So we had to um, say goodbye to Kembe, had really no idea what was gonna happen with him. They're home safe in Costa Mesa, but three-year-old Kembe is thousands of miles away in a world of complete and utter destruction. We've visited like seven times now and saying goodbye um, is something that you dread the whole time you're there, you know? And this was, this was the worst. Can't imagine. Well, Mark and Kristen Howerton are with us now to tell us the rest of the story. Mark and Kristen, thank you for joining us on the 700 Club. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Before we begin, Kristen, I want to mention that you write a blog called Rage Against the Minivan. What's the meaning behind that name? You know, it's kind of twofold. I mean, for one, it's just a silly exploration of just some of the things that we find ourselves doing as moms that we never thought we would do. Um, but in a way, you know, my blog is about exploring just kind of living beyond maybe what's expected and um, trying to find a bit more meaning in life. So it's a play on words as, with that as well. Can I just ask you, um, before I, I talk with Mark, that day when you left, I mean, there has to be a part of you as a mom that says, I need to get my baby that I brought with me out of here and back home to safety. But what in the world was it like for you to walk away and have to leave one of your children? I mean, I, I know as an adoptive mom that long before the adoption process is final, you are the parent of that child. The child grabs your heart, lives in your heart. You love them. They belong to you, so to speak. What was it like to have to leave Ken Bay behind with so much unknown? You know, I think... It was exactly like any mom would imagine. That's exactly how it felt, like leaving a child behind. Um, it was extremely emotional, really stressful. Um, you know, fortunately, he was in a really good orphanage taken care of by Heartline Ministries, which is a great organization in Haiti. And I felt just implicit trust with them that they were going to take care of him and the other kids in their care. So I knew that he was going to be taken care of as well as he could in Haiti. But at the same time, you know, you know, you didn't want to leave anybody behind in Haiti at that time. It was, it was a scary place. So it was, that, that was a dark couple of days for us when he was still in Haiti. So Mark, your wife and your youngest daughter come home and you're all sitting, I'm sure, glued to the television set for days because every, every one of us was watching and just praying for Haiti, watching what was happening. Those aftershocks were horrific. And then you're watching the, the news with Diane Sawyer and tell me about what you saw. Yeah. Oh, it was amazing. It was such an amazing blessing uh, what we got to see on TV. We're watching the news and um, Diane Sawyer shows up at an orphanage and it happens to be our son's orphanage. And she, she's on that, the site <clears throat> where our son is, is staying <clears throat> and um, she picks up our son Kimbe and she's hugging our son Kimbe at the end of the shot. And so here we are sitting in California watching the news glued to the TV, as you say, and we're seeing our son safely being held in the arms of Diane Sawyer, of all people. And, and to just think of, of the millions of orphans in Haiti, of the thousands of orphanages, she showed up at our orphanage <laughs> hugging our son. Amazing blessing. There's like a message from the Lord saying, I've got this one. <laughs> <laughs> so how did Ken Bay finally get out of Haiti? Yeah. Well, actually, ironically, that, that, that unique coincidence, that unique thing that God did with having Diane Sawyer at that orphanage really catapulted us into the ability to, to, uh, to, to be on the news, to do some, some uh, um, personal campaigning, to say, hey, let's try to get our son home. Let's try to petition the government. To, uh, to give him an exceptional visa, him and about 900 other uh, Haitian orphans who were matched with an American family, to give them a visa called humanitarian parole and allow him to come home as a refugee after a, a national crisis like this. And uh, through pretty rigorous petitioning, uh, talking with our congressmen, um, doing different news uh, shows and whatnot, um, they were able to do that. And uh, 900 of these kids, came home and we got to get uh, Kimbe home about a 
10 days after the earthquake. Wow, amazing. Well, Kristen, there's the adoption mm -hmm. and then there's the adaptation. You wrote about the challenges of adapting to your new family, even saying that at times you had to fake it. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, adopting a child who's not a newborn, um, you know, it's different. He had lived in an orphanage for three years and he'd never lived in a family, um, you know, and while you would think that orphans um, are sitting in orphanages pining away for a family, he was a little unsure at first if he really wanted a mom and dad, um, you know, who were going to be there to not only to care for him and nurture him, but to discipline and to guide him. That was, that was really hard for him at first. And so we had a rocky transition, as I think many adoptive parents do, especially adoptive parents who are taking in, you know, slightly older kids who've been in an institutional environment. And so, I mean, I'm happy to report that a year later, he's very, very happy living in a family. Um, but, you know, we had some adjusting to do and, and uh, you know, it was a big transition for him. Well, and recently, for us, I would say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I yeah. want to mention that because recently on our Facebook page, we asked our viewers to send in their adoption questions. And one person said she's thinking about adoption, but she's hesitating because people told her that she would be able to really love an adopted child. What do you think about that, Mark? Yeah, that, that, that is one of the miracles of God is that there is no difference in the love that, that I have as a parent for my children, if it's a biological, my biological daughter or my adoptive son, there is no difference whatsoever. I think that's one of the unique ways that, that God has created us as parents, <clears throat> as humans, to mm -hmm. say we can love our children as our children. And, and really, just to use the biblical metaphor, that it's the same aspect of God's complete adoption of, of us and of us being completely enfolded in his family without uh, qualifier, without hesitation. It is an amazing reflection of God's love. Well, for those of you who might have a heart for adoption, if you'd like to know more about the process, more about what it means to become family, you might want to follow the Howlertons. Check out their blog. It's called Rage Against the Minivan, and you can get a link to it by going to cbn.com. Thank you so much, Mark, Kristen, Howerton. Your family's wonderful, and we thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Uh -huh, bless you. Gordon? More than a year after Haiti's earthquake, the country is fighting an outbreak of cholera. Here's how Operation Blessing is helping doctors deal with the epidemic. 23-year-old Wilkie has a very dangerous job. Every day, he takes care of the sick and dying at this cholera clinic in Haiti. I have many different jobs. I do laundry. Of course, I help dumping the buckets with waste and cleaning them out. I know that cholera is a bacteria, so if I touch someone or touch their clothes without washing my hands with bleach, then I could get cholera. Wilkie started working here in November when a few cases of cholera suddenly turned into hundreds. That's why Operation Blessing helped to set up this medical clinic just behind a major hospital. 200 beds, 14 tents just for patients. But just two weeks into the treatment protocol, this clinic had a crisis. They'd run out of bleach. We use it everywhere, in a general water supply, to wash our hands, to do laundry, to spray the cots and the tents and the ground where patients have been. Bleach that was normally available in stores was now gone, or too expensive even for the hospital to buy. Fortunately, Operation Blessing had the solution that Wilkie needed, and plenty of it. We set up two chlorine generators that run round the clock, producing 120 gallons of bleach every 12 hours. We quickly delivered pallets of the product to Wilkie and his staff. When I saw the boxes of bleach, I was very happy. I just started putting it in the water to purify it. After four days without bleach, I didn't even ask anyone. I just started using it to clean and purify everything. And to help the clinic with what has become a 24-hour-a-day laundry operation, where staff have to pour buckets of water into washing machines just to get them to run, Operation Blessing installed this huge commercial washer and dryer. I would like to say a big thank you to Operation Blessing for all of your support. You have made a great difference in this fight against cholera. Blessing. And thank you, if you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that blessing. If you're not a member, we invite you to join with us now. We're a lot more than a TV show. It's because of faithful people who say, yes, we want to make a difference in the world today. We want to help people around the world. 
and enables the 700 Club to go into places like Haiti and provide very tangible relief for people in need. If you want to be a part of it, all you have to do is join. How much is that? It's $20 a month, 65 cents a day, and you join tens of thousands of people that want to make a difference. If that's you, call us right now, 1-800-759-0700, or you can log on to CBN.com when you sign up through the Internet, uh, or you can ask for it by phone. Either way, uh, you can sign up for Pledge Express. It's electronic monthly giving. Bank does all the work. There's no checks to write. There's nothing to mail in. We save so much on the processing, we can send back to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you want that, call us, ask for Pledge Express, 1-800-759-0700, or log on to CBN.com. Terry? Well, still ahead, a man who took a bad fall but refused to go to the doctor. I guess I just wanted to be macho. He more or less grew up in the, with the attitude, just suck it up and it'll, it'll go away. But this one didn't go away. It, it stayed with him. See how he finally got rid of that pain for good. I had chased the record deal for years with no results. And then I let it go and I turned it over to him and then there it is. I want people to know that you can't be bad enough for God to not love you or forgive you or to give you a second chance. He doesn't give you the right to judge you, so stop there and learn to love you the way he loves you. And then you can enjoy life more than you've ever enjoyed it before. When you look in the mirror, can you imagine erasing years of aging? That's what I used to look like. Lifestyle Lift takes only about an hour. See the difference immediately. I'm Linda. I'm 70 years old. Can you believe it? Call now for a free information kit. It's quick, affordable, and takes only about an hour. Lifestyle Lift, a breakthrough medical procedure that helps remove wrinkles, frown lines, and sagging skin. Call now for a free information kit. Consultations are free. Call Lifestyle Lift today. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. The Dallas area megachurch pastored by Bishop T.D. Jakes will no longer hold high school graduations. The Dallas Morning News reports that the Irving School District will stop running the megachurch in 2012 amid concerns about separation of church and state. The Potter's House seats several thousand people and the school district has been using that building since 2004. But the American Civil Liberties Union of Texas raised questions about holding the graduation ceremonies in a church. The new Egyptian government may reopen former churches that were shut down by ex-president Hosni Mubarak. Leaders are evaluating 48 closed churches on a case-by-case -case basis. The new cabinet is also talking about granting equality to Christians who want to build churches. One Christian activist in Egypt called the news a happy surprise. This comes as Muslim extremists in Egypt have been increasingly hostile toward Coptic Christians. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. In the next 60 seconds, we want you to qualify to be the next $50,000 home makeover winner. Pick up the phone and get ready to start dialing when the number appears on your screen. Call the number on your screen now and we'll mail you a key. If your key opens the lock in your local direct buy club, you'll be the next $50,000 home makeover winner. Operators are standing by, so call right now. Direct buy club is already awarded over a million dollars and someone is going to win the $50,000 home makeover. Why not you? If the phone number is blinking, the phone lines are open. Call now to receive your key and an invitation to your local direct buy club, where members can save thousands or more paying low direct from the source prices on big ticket items. Like kitchen cabinets, home furnishings, flooring, bathroom fixtures, and so much more. Call now and get your key to winning a $50,000 home makeover. Someone is going to win the $50,000 home makeover. Why not you? What makes the miracles of Jesus even more miraculous? Standing where they happened in Israel. Come explore Jerusalem where Jesus opened blind eyes. Visit the hills of Galilee where Jesus fed the multitude. Stroll through Capernaum where Jesus lived and taught and healed. To learn more about standing where it all happened in Israel, visit www.goisrael.com. Come visit Israel.
Like many men, Michael Knight never wanted to see a doctor. But five years after he fell from his roof, Michael was still in so much pain that he agreed to get medical help. Then suddenly, he didn't need it at all. Here's why. I was standing right here at this eve, uh, drilling a hole here for this spotlight, not realizing the dampness of the roof. My feet went out from under me, slid off, hit on my left leg onto this concrete patio right here. I asked him, tried to get him to go to the doctor, and he wouldn't do that. He says, nope, I'll be fine. I, I kind of walked out of it. I guess I just wanted to be macho. And I, I just took a little Motrin and I got the swelling down from my knee and it developed into just a pain when I would sit down right in the center of, of my knee when I was sitting or, or laying down. He more or less grew up in the, with the attitude, just suck it up and it'll, it'll go away. But this one didn't go away, it, it stayed with him. But it was progressively getting worse in the last year. And on December the 30th, making a New Year's resolution, I said, well, I think it's time to go to the doctor, get an x-ray, and I'll probably have to have surgery. Turn the 700 Club on immediately. He said, there's a man uh, sitting on a couch. Right now. Has pain in his left knee. You had pain in it, you had swelling in it. God is healing you right now. Immediately, my knee stopped hurting. I got up and started walking around. I said, well, I realized it doesn't hurt when I'm walking, so I laid back down and no pain. I haven't had a pain really in, in my knee since. When the Lord says he's gonna do something, he does it. And I don't question how or when. The Lord gave me a scripture that says, go to uh, Proverbs 13, 17. I went to the Message Bible and it, that proverb says, the reliable reporter is a healing presence. And I think that's what happened, you know, that Gordon uh, was reporting what the Holy Spirit was speaking to him, and it became a healing presence. I just look at it as the goodness of God. He loves us enough to reach right down where we're at. He does love us to reach right where we're at. Jesus is the reliable one. We're just witnesses. All we're doing is, is reporting what Jesus is doing. He's the one. Have faith in God. That's what Jesus said. You know, don't have faith in your own prayer. Don't have faith in your own faith. Don't have faith in some kind of ritual. Am I doing it the right way? I get that question a lot. Don't, no, no, no. Faith's in the wrong place. Have faith in God. When you do, you're having faith in a whole lot of facts. Here are the facts. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And what did Jesus do? He came and he paid the penalty for all sin, for all people, for all time, so that nothing would separate us from his love. Nothing, nothing. There's nothing you can do. You can't get away from his love. He, his love is just all encompassing. And in him we live and move and have our being. It's right there. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. All we have to do is believe the good news. Part of the good news is not just that Jesus died for our salvation. He died for our healing. That by his stripes, we were healed. And all we need to do is understand that on a very deep level. Not on a hoping, wishing level, but on a substance and evidence level that we understand, we see, we hear, we understand. And then we get it. So today, just have faith in God. Second thing that Jesus said, and this is all from Mark chapter 11, speak to the mountain. Speak to it. Speak out loud. Act your faith. And in that, there's tremendous power. When you believe, receive, and act, then you get it. Now, if you believe in your heart and don't doubt, this is again from Mark 11, you have what you ask for. When, when you receive it, you have it. Now, that, that's, it sounds complicated. It's not. It's very easy. It's just like, you know, believing your house exists. It's there. It's all around you. It's not an effort for you. 
believe that Jesus is right there with him, with you. His healing power is present right now. His presence, of the presence of that reliable reporter is with you right now. And you have all that you need right now. By his stripes you were healed. That means it's already done. Just receive it. Now, we're going to pray. Before we pray, we want to encourage you with some other people who have been healed. Here's Kimona from Bronx. Uh, she had uh, severe acid reflux. Um, the doctor prescribed medication. It didn't help at all. One day, she was watching the 700 Club. Terry, you had a word of knowledge. You said you have severe case of acid reflux. You get it every day. It's become life interrupting. Well, immediately, Kimona felt a warmth in her stomach, which then moved up into her throat. When she went for a checkup, the doctor confirmed she was no longer having any problems. She didn't need the medication anymore. And she can eat anything she wants. How fun. <laughs> That's Pepperoni great. pizza, here we go. There you go. Well, this came in from Marilyn, who lives in Aurora, Illinois. She says that for years she suffered severe headaches due to brain lesions from having had bacterial meningitis three oh. times. One day she was watching this program. She heard you, Gordon, give a word of knowledge. You said, God is healing lesions on the brain. Touch your head and be healed. Immediately, Marilyn's severe headache stopped. She said she hasn't had a bit of trouble since then. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wow. I didn't know her. Uh, you know, Terry didn't know Kimona. But we just received from, from the Lord. And we spoke. And the mountain moved. What about you? Can you do that? Can you just receive his healing presence right now? Understand that he's all around you. Understand that he's in you. If you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, he's in you. The word is not far from you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. And all you have to do is speak that word out. Now, in an act of faith, I want you to lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing. We're going to agree. The Bible says if two or more agree, touching anything, it shall be done. So we're going to agree, you're going to lay hands, and together we're going to speak to that illness, and you will receive healing. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you, and as people are acting in faith, we join with them, and we join in agreement. The agreement that, that scatters the enemy now. And a three-fold cord is not easily broken, so we come into agreement now with people laying hands on, on bodies now. We speak to that body now, be healed. Pain be gone. Limbs be loosed, eyes be opened, ears be opened. There's someone with a blockage in your throat, be opened now in Jesus' name. There's a man, you're laying your hand on your left knee. You've got severe pain. Uh, the doctors are, are using the word knee sprain, uh, but you're worried that there's something deeper in that socket. And God is, is saying, I, I take all the worry, I take all the fear, and I bring you healing right now. In Jesus' name, just receive healing into that joint. Now, begin to move it. What you couldn't do before, do now. Act your faith and move and realize God has healed your knee. Terry, what do you have? As someone has been in a catastrophic car accident, it's, um, this word is for the person who's praying for them. God is healing every one of the, the needs that that accident has created. And you'll know it's you because the doctor has actually used that term catastrophic to dis, dis, um, describe what's happened to your loved one. But God is touching and healing. He's right there with you. Just receive that. Speak it over the person you're praying for and that you love. I, I don't know if this is the same one. Um, there's a, someone you've had a, a brain injury, and the doctors are concerned about injury to the brain stem and some kind of impact from the top of the head to mm -hmm. the um, spinal cord. And um, God is just giving you reassurance right now. It's in his hands. His healing is, is working right now. And in Jesus' name, we just speak to that brainstem 
and, and rebuke any swelling, any bleeding, and ask for full neurological recovery. In Jesus' name, be healed. Someone else, you're laying hands on your right shoulder. Just begin to move it. Uh, there's someone else with uh, a kidney problem, and um, you've, you've already gone through a procedure for it, and you're worried. And in Jesus' name, be healed. Be restored in that kidney right now. It's your right kidney. God's healing it right now. In Jesus' name, be restored. And there's someone named Monica. You have been praying for your marriage for years, and you have just come to the place where you've said, it's too dead, there's nothing there, but you can never be too dead for a resurrection. God's about to change your marriage in a powerful way. Lord, we just thank you, and we praise you. Someone else with nerve damage and nerve in your right cheek, um, God's restoring that and, and bringing back your smile. Just <laughs> begin to smile and realize he's healed you and he's touched you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've been touched by God, we want to share in your good report. So give us a call, 1-800-759-0700. And we're here for you. Uh, we remind you, we're here seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. It's our honor. It's our privilege to agree with you in prayer. So if you need prayer, call us, 1-800-759-0700. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. We asked CBN.com users how we could make our website easier to use, and we listen. This is really easy to read and move through. The information opens up a whole lot quicker. Yeah, yeah it's much faster. There's mm -hmm. everything I'm interested in right here. The click of a mouse. The new CBN.com has been redesigned, making it faster to find your favorite 700 Club stories, musical guests, or online community with special features. Anyone can enjoy this new site. Visit the new CBN.com today. Well, we've got some live chat questions for us here. Here's the first one. Earlier today, we told the story of the Howertons, and then one person on our Facebook page asked, why do people have to go out of the United States to adopt children? Is it hard to adopt them here? Well, no, I don't think it's hard to adopt them here. It's actually much more expensive, I believe, to adopt them out of the country. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes people feel like children, especially in third world countries, have no hope, no future, no way out of uh, what's, what's often a situation in country that's just kind of poverty riddled and, <clears throat> and without hope. But I am a firm believer that it, wouldn't it be wonderful here in the United States if every Christian foster cared a child in the foster care system. Sometimes, sometimes children aren't available for adoption. They come from dysfunctional families. Many times those strings are, are cut and you can go forward with the adoption. But to teach children in this country what it means to be family, I'm in total agreement with you. I think we ought to reach out to the children here at home, but not so much in lieu of children in other countries. It's not an either or, I think it's an and also. I've done both and I think it's wonderful. Variety is the spice of life, right? right. <laughs> Got another question. This is on marriage. Uh, comes in from Pat. My daughter has been married for six years, has two children. Her husband has abandoned the family four times during the marriage, usually to binge drink. As a Christian, is, he oblig is she obligated to stay with him? Well, I think he's abandoned is the word that's been used. And biblically speaking, I think you have grounds to move on. And sometimes for the sake of your children and to show what real family is, you need to do that. If the unbeliever leaves, let him. That's what Paul said. We leave you these words from Psalms. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. God bless you. We'll see you again. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. 
I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy.